There was a time when men became legends. There was a place whose name alone today evokes a great myth, the city of Troy. Homer immortalized the Greeks Ulysses, Hector, and Achilles in about 800 BC in stories about events that occurred centuries before. In modern times, archaeologists have rediscovered the Greece of the great poet Homer and walked in the footsteps of the heroes of his epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Using Homer as a guide, excavations have discovered breathtaking golden marvels and uncovered a powerful Aegean civilization from the second millennium BC. More than 3,000 years ago, along the southeastern shores of the Greek mainland, there existed a flourishing civilization whose heroes inspired poets and playwrights. Homer sang about the great deeds of the Achaean people, the first Greeks, and later playwrights such as Sophocles and Euripides used Homer's heroes to create stories filled with glory, gold, and tragedy. The Achaean people flourished about 3,500 years ago. To help reconstruct a picture of their ancient world and better understand these people, we rely on two different yet closely related arts, archaeology and literature. Homer's poetic histories, written in about 800 BC, define the Achaeans as Greek tribes. Thousands of years later, these powerful and courageous people inspired some of the most beautiful works of literature. Modern archaeology defines the Achaean as the Mycenaeans, taking the name from the richest and most important city in the Greek world in its time, Mycenae. Mycenae, along with the cities of Argos and Tiryns, were powerful centers of this civilization. These cities grew in the southern part of Greece, known as the Peloponnesian Peninsula. Beginning as a series of small hilltop villages, these settlements grew into wealthy fortified towns. The aristocrats who ruled these thriving city-states organized and developed themselves into the preeminent power in the Mediterranean world. Situated on high ground, Argos, Tiryns, and Mycenae soon evolved into urban centers. Mycenae was the strongest power in the region, yet the cities of Argos and Tiryns seemed to have been independent. Each had its own ruler, palace, and fortified citadel. The center of political control was the palace, which ruled over huge areas of land, trade, and industries. With the decline of the Minoan civilization, the Mycenaeans invaded Crete and captured the Minoan capital, Knossos. The Mycenaeans absorbed the Minoans' culture and ruled on Crete for more than two centuries. Mycenaean military dynasties replaced the Minoans' highly successful maritime trade and commercial interests with their own. The influence of the Mycenaeans thus spread to Egypt, the coast of Turkey, southern Italy, and Sicily. Mycenaean merchants exported textiles, wine, perfumes, manufactured metal goods, and important metal ores. They set up trading posts and developed colonies. Their art and fashion, weapons and pottery, 
were exported and copied throughout the known world. Argos is one of the few cities from the Mycenaean age to have a modern city alongside its glorious ruins. Once a much larger city, the only ruins from the Mycenaean age to survive are those on top of the Acropolis. Argos has existed without interruption since the Bronze Age. Its ruins are mostly classical, Greek and Roman, periods that were the city's most fortunate after the splendor of the Mycenaean age. During the classical Greek period, Argos was an important center of the cult of Hera, the queen of the heavens, wife of Zeus. Hera was the guardian of marriage and women, a perfect example of fidelity among the goddesses. The walls of the temple of Hera, the focal point of the impressive sanctuary, still stand today. The temple was entered by a large staircase measuring more than 240 feet wide. Crowds would mass outside along the steps during important religious events where sometimes hundreds of animals would be sacrificed at the altar. This terracotta model of the ancient temple of Hera dates from the first years of the sanctuary's existence around the 7th century BC. The cult of Hera lasted centuries and thrived until Roman times. At the Mycenaean city of Tiryns, we find the ruins of a genuine Bronze Age civilization. The intact city walls of Tiryns offer an impressive example of Mycenaean fortifications which date to about 1250 BC. The late classical Greeks were in awe of these massive ramparts. They believed the Cyclops, the mythical race of one-eyed giants of Greek mythology, built these walls. Because of this legend, these types of stone walls are known as Cyclopean masonry. The difference between the Minoans and the Mycenaean uh, are societies in general. Uh, the Minoans were a thalassocracy. They roamed through the seas of the Aegean um, and the Mediterranean world, uh, whereas the Mycenaeans uh, apparently felt the need to be um, uh, to have a fortification, uh, which would eventually protect them from the outer. Uh, people that might be coming in. And the whole idea of xenophobia, the whole idea of uh, the fear of uh, foreigners. These fears compelled the people of Tiryns to build their rampart 26 feet thick and up to 30 feet high. These walls are characteristic of Mycenaean strongholds. Tiryns is the best preserved example of Mycenaean fortifications, which allowed the city to continue to function even during a long siege. These fortifications required not only great physical effort, but also advanced architectural skills. These passages protected troops as they moved to counter any army besieging the city. Passages built into the walls ensured that civil and military functions could continue without interruption during a siege. No traces of Mycenaean temples have been found. The glory of a city wasn't its temples or sanctuaries, as in the later classical age, but as with the Minoans, was centered on the palace of the king. Practically nothing other than the huge fortification walls surrounding the palace in Tiryns remains, though a few frescoes reveal some of its magnificence. This boar hunting scene portrays dogs chasing a boar wounded by a hunter's spear. Another fresco shows a cart carrying two women in a procession. This Mycenaean woman with large eyes, flowing hair, flounced skirts, and a low-cut bodice shows the influence of the Minoans of Crete. The Mycenaeans not only took over the Minoan trading empire, but they also adopted Minoan art, clothing, and hairstyles as their own. This Mycenaean fresco of a woman 
recalls one of the most delightful images of Minoan civilization. This gold ring found in Tiryns is engraved with a charming scene of women waving goodbye to a ship leaving the harbor. It was probably a frequent scene for the Mycenaeans, a warrior culture that never stopped thinking about war, conquest, and domination. The heart of the Mycenaean civilization was naturally Mycenae. The fortified Acropolis of Mycenae stands on an impressive rocky spur that dominated the region. According to the legend, um, Perseus, who was a mythological king hero, uh, was the founder of the city of Mycenae. It was Perseus who, according to myth, employed uh, the Cyclops to build the megalithic type of uh, structures that they're prominent right now in uh, areas such as Mycenae, Tiryns, etc. throughout the Peloponnese. From their citadel, the lords of Mycenae achieved fame and prosperity without equal in Greece. They forged links deep into Europe, trading gold, bronze and amber, which they exported through the Aegean and many other Mediterranean ports. When the legendary Agamemnon, king of Mycenae, marched his men off to Troy, he left behind a rich kingdom that prospered from trade in textiles, crafted goods, vases, beads, ivory, and olive oil. During times of warfare, the leading Mycenaean sovereign was chosen and recognized by all the tribal city-states. In Homer's epic poem, The Iliad, Agamemnon was recognized as supreme leader and led the Achaeans in their legendary expedition against Troy. No one is sure why, but Mycenae suffered a swift decline and was abandoned at the end of the second millennium BC. For thousands of years, the essential characteristics of Mycenae have been preserved. There are two walls at Mycenae, which snake around the edge of the mound. The first dates to the 13th century, the other to the 12th century BC. The first wall was built with huge blocks of uncut stones, with seams filled with smaller stones and rubble. The second wall was built of irregular rows of cut rectangular blocks. Apart from the size and strength of the city walls, the Mycenaeans, in order to survive a long siege, made sure they were not deprived of the most precious commodity, water. The region around Mycenae is rich in underground water, the Mycenaeans dug a deep tunnel into the bedrock to a spring known as the Fountain of Persia, which supplied water to the whole city. The famous Lion Gate allows entry into the citadel of Mycenae. The top of the gateway alone weighed more than 20 tons. And we find the oldest monumental sculpture in Europe two carved lions standing with their front paws on a column. We have uh, two lions facing a column. Uh, there are many, many hypotheses as to what the, is the exact meaning of the two lions. One being uh, the apotropaic nature of the lions, meaning they are to ward off uh, evil and perhaps word of, you know, scare off, so to speak, uh, all these strange people that might want to invade. Another being that uh, perhaps have Agamemnon perpetuate his uh, power throughout the Mycenaean world and the world far beyond that. After his victory at Troy, Agamemnon passed through the Lion Gate on his return to Mycenae. Yet it is also where he met his death at the hands of his wife, Clytemestra and her new lover, Aegisthus. Mycenae had a trapezoidal plan, with the side facing the Acropolis shorter than the external side, giving the city the shape of a fan. It was in these buildings that craftsmen created many splendid objects discovered at this site.
The fabulous funerary masks date to the earliest period of the Mycenaeans, about 1550 BC. Made of pure gold, the masks covered the faces of noble dead, but there was much more discovered, such as decorated daggers, great ritual vases, golden cups, and large amounts of jewels deposited in the royal and aristocratic tombs. The Mycenaean palace was quite different from the decorated, airy, and refined Minoan palaces. The center of the Mycenaean palace was the royal audience hall, called the Megarons. The design of the Megarons would become the model for the classical Greek temple. The Megarons centered on a large rectangular room. It was divided into three elements, also rectangular in shape. Entering was through a deep portico with two columns in an antechamber, which led to the throne room. The throne room was the seat of power. It was about 50 feet long by 35 feet wide. A great hearth was set between four large wooden columns. The base of the fireplace, about 12 feet in diameter, was raised and decorated. The columns supported the roof beams and the 15-foot high ceiling, which opened up to a second level. Smoke would rise up from the hearth through a hole in the roof. The most important significance is that the plan of the Megaron. Uh, the idea of the Megaron, uh, the domos, which is the inner room, and um, the prodomos, which is the outer part of the Megaron, are basically uh, both elements that are found later on uh, in the architecture of classical uh, temples. The Megaron contained the emblem of the monarch's power, the king's throne. The walls must have been richly decorated with paintings and ornamental carvings to stress the dignity of the king's abode. Archaeologists over the years have pieced together a picture of Mycenaean life from palace frescoes, tombstones, and vases, which often depict scenes of daily life. We have visual representations of women of that society, and they appear in frescoes, they appear in vases. What we have is um, the visual that has been left for us behind uh, by the artist that decided to paint on this wall. And then the real, meaning the actual evidence, archaeological evidence, that points to the fact that these uh, women were indeed represented in a realistic or in as much as a realistic way as possible. The Mycenaean ruling class enjoyed a full life of sport. In hunting scenes, nobles hunted wild boar and deer using spears and shields. The boar's tusks were sliced lengthwise and attached to a cloth cap to form a warrior's helmet. Many of these scenes depict the aggressive and powerful city-state involved in expeditions, military raids, and war. This image of warriors on a vase found at Mycenae features the much-feared Mycenaean soldier. This is the most genuine portrayal of Mycenaean warriors that has come down to us. He wears a leather helmet and is armed for combat with a lance and a shield of bull's hide. Just outside the walls of the citadel is a peaceful valley scattered with Mycenaean tombs, the monumental Tholos tombs were built in the last period of Mycenaean power during the 13th century BC. These Mycenaean funerary structures are particularly impressive. The best preserved Tholos tomb was built about 1250 BC. The Roman Pausanias who discovered this magnificent tomb gave it the misleading name Treasury of Atreus after Atreus the legendary father of Agamemnon. Two 118 foot long rows of cut rectangular blocks increasing in height form the entrance. At the end of this open hall stands the impressive monumental facade 
containing a door over 16 feet high and almost 10 feet wide. The lintel stones over the doorway weigh over 100 tons, an amazing engineering feat in the ancient world. The interior of the great circular chamber measures 48 feet across and over 42 feet high. It is built of concentric rows of stone block, shaped and stuccoed into a false dome. A small funerary chamber lies to one side of the main chamber. The treasury of Atreus was robbed of its contents long ago, but other Mycenaean tombs have been found intact. Heinrich Schliemann, a wealthy German merchant, invested his fortune in a dream to revive Homer's Greece. Guided by the poems of Homer and a Roman travelogue, this extraordinary 19th century amateur archaeologist excavated the legendary sites of Ithaca and Troy. After his success in locating the ancient city of Troy, the pioneering excavator turned his attention to Mycenae. From childhood, he had dreamed of bringing Homer to life by discovering the world of the Iliad, hidden for centuries. In 1876, Schliemann arrived in Greece and traveled to Mycenae, guided by Homer's description of Mycenae as rich in gold and the Roman Pausanias's travel log, Schliemann began digging behind the Lion Gate inside the city at a place later defined as Circular Tomb A. Schliemann's excavations at Mycenae at the Grave Circle A is probably the most important archaeological discovery um, on the Greek mainland because for the first time it brought a legendary past uh, to life in many ways. It gave material evidence for a Bronze Age past that we had only heard about from the poetry of Homer in the epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Schliemann's excavations included a number of pits and trenches and proceeded to unearth a royal graveyard. The graves were little more than simple pits lined with stone and were striking in contrast to what was found accompanying the dead. The bodies discovered by Schliemann were covered and surrounded with gold. Buried with the dead were cups, beakers, ornaments, bowls, plates, decorated daggers, and weapons, many made of solid gold. The most famous of these items were the royal funeral masks. Of these royal masks, one revealed the impressive face of a bearded man with Greek features. Schliemann thought this mask belonged to Agamemnon. Today, Archaeologists believe these masterpieces date to the first or second half of the 16th century BC, long before Agamemnon and the Trojan War. Before Schliemann, almost nothing else was known about the citadel. Only Homer's stories and Aeschylus's play, thought to be poetic inventions, revealed anything about this powerful civilization. Schliemann's excavations introduced this vanished age, which reached its peak in the second millennium BC. Sadly, through internal disturbance, economic collapse, coupled perhaps with foreign invasion, all Mycenaean palaces and towns were sacked or abandoned by the end of the 12th century BC. The fall of the mighty Mycenaeans ended one of the most feared civilizations of the Bronze Age. It also marked the end of the Bronze Age itself. From the ashes of the Mycenaean would be born the Hellenists and later the classic Greeks. The legends and myths of the Mycenaeans lived on as a key part in the development of the history and literature of the Western world. <laughs>